Thank you so much, Tan, and thank you, David, both of you for inviting me. Um, first, let me try to uh, reconcile some strange uh, apparent contradictions. You know, how did someone who works now at the Voice of America for over 21 years uh, and who's from Western Pennsylvania of Ashkenazi descent, you know, get involved in such a, you know, such a project? Well, I was always interested when I was young for some reason in, you know, Al-Andalus, Sephardic heritage and history. And I was exposed to Moroccans in my little hometown near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And at any rate, but more to the point, um, I, when I was, my first job out of graduate school, I was managing scholarship programs in New York City at the African-American Institute and I was in charge of all the Portuguese speaking countries. So including Cabo Verde, São Tomé e Príncipe, Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique, of course, and Angola later on, but particularly those three small countries, they had just reached independence and they were sending their students to the United States under government scholarships, our USAID. Um, and we were sort of competing at that time with the Soviet Union for hearts and minds at any rate, I was managing these scholarship programs and some of my students, the Cape Verdean students had Jewish surnames, Cohen, Levy, Ben Oliel, Ben Shimal, Wanon. And I asked them, you know, if they could explain and they told me that their ancestors came from Morocco. And so that really uh, piqued my interest. And it just so happened that my counterpart in Cabo Verde, the gentleman in charge of scholarship programs in the Ministry of Cooperation. He himself was of Jewish descent, he told me. His family name is Brigham, and we later find out that that name is Ohayon, which is a very typical Moroccan Jewish name. And uh, anyway, long story short, you know, it's, this is a personal interest of mine, so I ask questions, and he says, oh, I can introduce you to somebody, somebody who wants to, you know, uh, revive interest in Jewish heritage, particularly restore the dilapidated cemetery. So I find out there are actually small Jewish cemeteries there. So anyway, this is always on the side of my normal job. So over time, when I, uh, I started visiting Cape Verde in the early nineties on my own dime and started looking into it with the gentleman he introduced me to, his name is Januario Nascimento. He's from the old Dai family from Tangier. And so that really starts my journey. And he has his own, you know, proposal to UNDP and he can't raise money. And, and I said, let me see if I can help you. Well, then I discover, you know, I can't really help him unless I myself create a nonprofit in the United States, you know, a 501c3. So it took many, many years, you know, because you, you have, you work for a living, uh, you know, that wasn't doing this, you know, wasn't certainly not making any money. I was spending my own money. And, but I was very passionate about it because when I saw those little cemeteries, it really brought tears to my eyes. It was a beautiful sight to behold. And you see Cabo Verde there, this, we've, you know, magnified it on this map. It's at the crossroads of, of, uh, of Africa, West Africa, North Africa, Europe, and, and the United States. Uh, and, you know, it's not even the size of Rhode Island in the United States, a very tiny place. So how was it that, you know, Moroccan Jews went there uh, and established a small community such that they even created, as we call it, Judaism, you know, Khaver Khadesha burial grounds. So I set out to learn more about that. I joined forces with the young man. So we were always together, but I had to create the 501c3 to raise money. You know, even though I'm a nice lady, nobody's going to just give me money and expect that I will, you know, spend it properly. So we set all the legal framework up in 2007. It took a while. In the meantime, I was making contacts in Morocco and I had left the um, African-American Institute and started working at VOA in Washington, DC. So that's a little bit of my personal background. And now you see Cape Verde in the 19th century. It's a transatlantic hub. And the 19th century is very important because we're talking about Jews who came in the 19th century. So after the inquisition had ended, which is significant because of course, Cape Verde is a, or was then a Portuguese colony and Portugal like Spain, you know, uh, instituted the inquisition and uh, either 
you left if you were a Jew or if you converted. That was the Portuguese way. They like to baptize everybody. Uh, at any rate, that's just some history. So let's go for, forward. And why, does it, why is it important, you know, this small country? We know about Sephardim uh, as, as the organization that David and Ton run uh, around the world, you know, the Iberian Peninsula and off to the Ottoman Empire, North Africa, and so forth. But very few people know about this little Moroccan diaspora in Cabo Verde. So I was determined to honor their memory along with the, the descendants who were pressing for the restoration of the cemeteries. As I say here, it's a mitzvah, as you know, to honor the deceased. And of course, these Jews were part of uh, the Cape Verdean identity because even though Cape Verde is a miscegenation between uh, you know, Africans and mostly Portuguese, we have a significant number of Sephardim, mostly Moroccans, who went there. And believe me, they had a lot of offspring. Uh, and, you know, we know that, of course, through the various names, um, patrilineal uh, names. And, of course, Cape Verde is off the radar of most major Jewish organizations. So it was sort of a, a, a vacuum. It was a, it was a um, you know, th there was a need to, somebody needed to take take uh, interest in, and bring this to light. And of course, memory is very important to the Jewish people. So let's go back historically. Even though we're documenting the history of these Jews who came in the 19th century, really for in search of religious freedom, but mostly for economic opportunities, I'll get into that in a moment. There was a so-called first wave, you know, because Cape Verde was a Portuguese colony, there's no question that there were new Christians that, that is Jews who were forced to convert to Christianity, probably among those, set, those settlers, colonialists. But of course, by then, you know, they had to hide their religion. Maybe some of them practiced in secret, but there's no way to really trace them. And other historians have already done that. And, and those stories are very interesting. Uh, I'll leave that to the experts, but my organization, the, the Cape Verde Jewish Heritage Project, is determined to document as much as possible those Jews who came from Morocco and also Gibraltar. So there's an English connection in the 19th century. Uh, they created Jewish burial grounds, and which is why you know their presence is so significant, uh, because it is one of the first thing Jews usually do when they go to a foreign land. So that's the that's the wave that we are looking at. And who were they? Well, they were mostly male. They were from pretty educated families and they spoke different languages, mostly from Northern Morocco, Tanger, Tetouan, Rabat, and then further South, Mogador, which was occupied for some years by the Portuguese, but they, they faced a lot of resistance. Anyway, over time, the name changed to Essaouira. But Mogador, um, used to be almost 50% Jewish back in the, uh, in the early 1900s, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And the gentleman we're looking at is Isaac Pinto, who was one of the original immigrants and he's buried in uh, one of the cemeteries. And why did they leave? Well, I did allude to the fact that the Inquisition was abolished in 1821. Uh, they were seeking, you know, greater, Religious freedom and economic stability. There were deteriorating economic conditions in northern um, Morocco. There was the remnants of the Spanish Moroccan war. There was a lot of unemployment, and and many Jews, you know, set sail uh, for uh, other places. Uh, many went to northern Brazil. We'll see some remnants of that in Manaus and Belém do Pará. That was the rubber boom that you know, drew them. In Cape Verde, you know, such a small place, but as you see, it's at this cross section of continents. And maybe they were there on a stopover and decided to stay there. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the Gibraltarian connection is important. And that's because for the third point, as you know, and David knows this, the British and the Portuguese have always had a friendly relationship throughout history. They've never fought a war. And so think about it. Uh, the British have been in Gibraltar since early 1700s. And who, who did the uh, British trade with primarily? Well, they looked over the Straits of Gibraltar and did a lot of business with the Moroccan Jews. Of course, they were not doing business with the Spanish, their enemies, 
And so a lot of Jews from Northern Morocco, Tanger, Tetuan, they uh, settled in Gibraltar. And so you have these Jews then, uh, once they have this, there's a preferential trade treaty between Morocco, excuse me, Portugal and uh, England in 1842. And that opened the way for many British to go to Cabo Verde. And they went there, they established coal stations and other businesses and trading posts. And some of the Jews came with them from Gibraltar. And we have even, some uh, have British passports, but they were originally from Morocco. So that British Portuguese alliance is very key to the history. And as I keep saying, it was a critical transatlantic hub uh, at that time. And these are some of the cities, San Vicente, where the British established coal stations. And then San Quentin is, is a beautiful agricultural island not far away and these other islands as well. So what do we have here? We mostly have uh, the place names in Cabo Verde. You know, we have a town called Synagoga. Uh, we have burial grounds, four Moroccan Jewish cemeteries, about 40 plus graves in all of these different islands, mostly four, actually, yes, four islands, but three in particular. And a lot of headstones with both Portuguese and Hebrew. And uh, so that's what marks their presence today. And this is just a little saying in Portuguese from one of the descendants, Nuno Wanon, who lives now in Brussels. Os nomes ficaram, mas a prática foi-se. Really, the names remained, but the practice of Judaism, uh, you know, disappeared because. Despite all these names, they were mostly male, as, as you recall, I said. And so over time, they really married into the local population. Don't forget, this is a predominantly Catholic country, notwithstanding its very small size, and, uh, but it's Catholic, uh, and yet they were open. Uh, so these Jews, by the names, as you can see here, all very familiar, I'm sure, to all of you. Uh, we have names. Uh, all of these names exist in the population, or some, some don't, but you see them on the tombstones. And uh, they, they intermarried over time, literally, you know, assimilated out of existence. But there's a lot of pride and that is why we feel it's important and the cemeteries that they left behind and their other legacies, which we'll talk about very briefly. So I just wanna quickly show you how the Jews of Morocco had, have a, a footprint in so many other places we know and Cape Verde is just one of the newer places we're learning about. Clearly uh, the Jewish merchants, as I said, migrated to Gibraltar. And these are some you know, street signs in Gibraltar. If some of you have been there, it's just a fascinating place. Uh, Seruya, Konemasias, Benros, I mean, there's four synagogues. It's a very lively and extremely interesting place with a strong Moroccan Jewish tradition. And it's from there also that we uh, have some of the Jews who went to Cape Verde. Cabo Verde. And this is on the left, you see a synagogue in Gibraltar, the typical Moroccan fashion. And on the right, I think he's a relative of somebody who works with uh, David and, and Ton. This is uh, Joshua Marache. He's a, uh, a researcher of the Jews uh, in, in, um, in Gibraltar. Uh, and uh, he's in one of the, he's in the old cemetery. And you see, as you can see, they built the cemetery in order to have a view of Morocco in the distance. So that was a very deliberate uh, decision on their part. It was very moving. And then we have, of course, the Azores. Uh, it was Azores. Uh, this is Portuguese territory, but who went there again in the 1800s? None other than the Moroccan Jews. Again, after 1821, there was less, you know, scare about any kind of, you know, priests coming after the Jews, uh, notwithstanding, you know, um, even if they've converted and so forth. So there was also searching for more freedom and economic opportunities. There was the orange trade. And so you have on the left, that's the Azores in San Miguel, uh, one of the, Jew the, the main Jewish cemetery. As you can see, all the tombstones are similar as we see in Morocco. And on the right is in Faro, which is in Southern Portugal in the Algarve. Again, all mostly all Moroccan Jews who went to the southern Portugal 
actually even earlier than 1821, I think it was Marcus de Pombal asked the Jews to come back, you know, to Portugal and said they nobody would bother them. They want, he wanted them to help rebuild the after the earthquake. This is this is what I've learned from my colleagues in these uh, in in Farua. So again, uh, just another photo contrasting. You have the Faro on the top and on the bottom in, in Gibraltar. And this is the cemetery, the entrance in uh, San Miguel in the Azores. And that's a beautiful place because there you really have a much stronger footprint, but still there's something about Portuguese territories uh, maybe the exception would be Brazil, Northern Brazil, we'll talk about in a moment, but there's a lot of assimilation. These Ben Saud, ben Saud the Buzagolo, Azule, Ben Saud, especially Ben Saud, if you recall, Jorge Sampaio was the president of Portugal many years ago. He is on his mother's side, a Ben Saud. So anyway, there was a beautiful synagogue, Sahar Hasamain. It's now a museum, as you can see on the right, it, had been it was a mess and it's been restored. It's a beautiful museum in São Miguel, Ponte Delgado, Ponte Delgada. And I encourage anyone interested uh, to, to go there, to see the history of the Moroccan Jews. It's extraordinary. And at one time they had five synagogues in Ponte Delgada alone. And uh, it, it's just, and then of course the Azores are a be beautiful islands to visit for hiking and you know, outdoors. Okay, now we're going to the other Moroccan diaspora in the 19th century. And that of course is in Manaus. And I say this because they're all related. These are all Moroccan diaspora communities. And, and so they came from the same route, primarily Northern Morocco, looking for, you know, economic opportunities. This was the rubber boom then. And the Moroccan Jews were intimately involved in that. And and uh, and this is where they settled. And but in in contrast to Ponte Delgado and and, and in Cabo Verde, uh, similar to Gibraltar, this was this is a community that stuck together. Um, there might have been some intermarriage, but they really there was a greater population. They married among each other, and there's a, still a strong community in Manaus. And that's Rabbi Daan, Daan on the left, and some of the other congregants on the right. I was there right before COVID, so February 2020. And this Annie Benchimal, as you know, Benchimal, a very big name in Morocco. She's that's the cemetery in Manaus, and on the right is a mikvah. There's another big community in Belém do Pará, but I didn't get to go there, unfortunately. So it was too far <clears throat> for the time I had. And now we're going to go to back to sort of the Cape Verde Moroccan connection. Uh, back in 2015, uh, I was asked by the Ministry of Diaspora in Morocco to lead a delegation of of descendants. Now this is the Moroccans really know how to market their country. They were so excited that I was working to promote and rather preserve the memory of Moroccan Jews in uh, Cabo Verde that they said, well, we wanna bring some of your descendants to see the land of their ancestors. And they paid for that trip, which was extraordinary. In 2015, I took a group of, and you'll see them on the right there in the Hayam Pinto synagogue in Esawira on the right. Those were, those were the people, some of them on the older side, a lot of women, and they were all either from the Cohen family, the Benros, Benchimal, we had Wano, and, uh, and Brigham and Anawari. So, and on the left, I believe that's in Tetuan, and they, we were exploring the, the cemetery and they were looking for their family names and, and they were there. So that was very meaningful. And here's another picture of uh, one of the larger families, Wanon and Wahnon, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, so that's Isaac, who's circled on the left, and his wife, Raquel Levy Bintu, both of whom, believe it or not, so they they were born in Gibraltar. And so that's the example of how the, the Gibraltarian connection uh, the, with the English going to Cabo Verde in the 19th century. Uh, and so they were part of that. And this is their offspring, as you can see, many, many children uh, born in Cabo Verde. And, and that family is very well known. In fact, a former prime minister, his name is um, Carlos Juanon de Carvalho Vega. Uh, he was the first democratically elected prime minister of Cabo Verde, so like in 1991, because it was a one party state, you know, until 
the uh, wall fell <clears throat> and he became he elected. And he's sort of an elder statesman now. <clears throat> and so that's basically to say that whether in the public life or even in the private sector, these Jews, though they were few in number, they really have uh, made an impact on Cape Verdean development. And people know that. And we're, we're trying to document that. Not to say, you know, it's some, somehow better, but they, the few, despite being few in number, they, they had sort of a disproportional impact uh, in, in many ways that we're, we're trying to document. And as I said, they were involved in commerce, trade, import, export, huge, excuse me, um, uh, pelt, salt, you know, foodstuffs, agriculture, coffee, especially in the island of San Quinto, and then that sugarcane alcohol, which they call grog, the Pinto family, particularly, and you still see uh, in San Quinto, you know, the old uh, trapiche, I forget what you call, how you say, call that, you know, to make the sugar cane, uh, to collect the sugar cane. Uh, it, they were f famous in this uh, particular industry. Shipping in the island of Boa Vista with David Benoliel, his parents, Abrão Benoliel and uh, Esther Benatar. Uh, he basically was known as having fueled the economy of, of, of Boa Vista, this little tiny island, the closest island to the African continent, West African continent. Uh, and uh, he was known as a good man, Nyo David. And then some one or two went into colonial administration, the Benros family, and others traveled to the other small island of Saint Tomé, and then Angola, of course, which was a, is a much larger country, but they had, they left their mark there. But sort of Cabo Verde seemed to be the hub from which they traveled. And as I said, there was a lot of intermarriage and that's why, you know, we don't have an active community today. Just have a lot of people with names. You have the cemeteries and a lot of pride, which is interesting. Um, people are really feel very proud for the most part if they have Jewish descent. I think they, I, I think they identify Jews with success and at least in their history, they were in these, you know, in, in business and trade. And for the most part, that was viewed positively and that they made a positive impact on the country. And of course, the fact that it's patrilineal descent, as we all know, as Jews, uh, you know, mostly Jews uh, are educated through the mother and, and Judaism, Judaism is passed through the mother uh, for obvious reasons. You always know who your mother is. <laughs> but on the other hand, um, you know, so they, they lacked that. There were very few who had were Jewish through their mother. They didn't create synagogues that we know of. There is a town called Synagoga. We're still trying to determine, you know, if that has a relationship with the Jewish community, but they did create burial grounds. And of course, we know that that's probably the most important thing a Jew can do when they go to a new place. And they were, as I said, part of this educated economic elite. And as far as we know, from the interviews I've had with the older people, they didn't sense any discrimination, but they were they were rather discreet. I mean, you know, I think Sephardim are good in that way. They uh, they sort of go along to get along, particularly the Moroccans. You know, they realized they were in a large Catholic country. They weren't going to be able to, you know, necessarily impose on their children to follow the Jewish faith. And I think they just figured, you know, live and let live. And maybe that's bad in way in the, in some ways, but. They really didn't have the um, the wherewithal to, you know, to perpetuate, I guess, the community. And over time, you know, they, they assimilated. And in terms of the organization, I'll just go back quickly. You know, I created the organization in 2007 through a 501c3 here, and I'm, a, I'm strictly a volunteer. I work at, continue to work at the Voice of America. So I work on this, and that's why things go a little more slowly. Plus, as you know, in a developing country, Things go much you know, more slowly, but over time, you know, we wanted to get permission in the country. We always, I always asked the then prime minister, which wasn't uh, the, the former prime minister who's of Jewish descent, but his successor, you know, if we can work in the country, we had letters of agreement, the city halls who were sort of in charge of cemetery, their local cemeteries. We, so it took time and over time, we, we have these agreements with the central government and then over time in, June, just recently, a couple of years, about four years ago, the government, because of our advocacy, they classified all the little Jewish cemeteries as national cultural historical patrimony. Of course, that's a very important. 
to protect them from you know, ever being, God forbid, bulldozed or disturbed. Uh, but it still takes a lot of work, but we're glad that that legal protection exists. And uh, in the picture, you'll see the Minister of Culture on the left and on the right is our lovely representative, uh, Sofia de Oliveira Lima, who's from the Wanon family. And she continues to be our representative to this day. Now, why I have a picture of King Mohammed the fifth, excuse me, the sixth, because somebody has to finance this, right? Well, it was not easy in the beginning. You know, we were created just when the, right, the, the financial uh, crash in 2009. And so raising money is bad enough, but raising money for, excuse the expression, dead Jews, you know, is all the more challenging. But uh, over time, I persisted. We had a fundraiser at the Moroccan embassy. It kicked things off. Some, you know, we got some here, some money there. But at some point, I approached the king of Morocco because at the time that we started, he himself was working on financing the restoration of cemeteries in Morocco, Jewish cemeteries. So me, my board and I decided that we would approach his majesty and say, look, uh, would he be willing to extend the project to Cape Verde, knowing that this was like Moroccan Jewish patrimony, you know, on Cape Verdean soil. And it didn't take long, I guess, our pitch uh, resonated with him. And one day I got a call from the, from the palace, from his finance guy, you know, asking to speak with me. And I almost fell off my chair in which uh, he said, you know, the King was very moved by your proposal and he wanted to know where he could send the funds. So that's very, very meaningful for us. And that has really fueled, uh, you know, our small budget. And then since then we've been able to raise other money. So. So a Muslim Moroccan king financing Jewish burial grounds in a predominantly Catholic country. It's quite, it's quite symbolic and very meaningful. Whoops, a couple of other big sponsors, some may or may not know S. Daniel Abraham here in the United States. He's uh, known for Slim Fast, the, the diet drink. They made a lot of money with Slim Fast, but he's also the head and founder that is of the Center for Middle East Peace. And uh, he knew uh, Andre Azoulé, who is of course a very senior counselor to the king and his, he was very important in his father's time, King Hassan II. But at any rate, through Mr. Azoulé, we got a hold of, uh, we felt important that we should have a Jewish philanthropist alongside the Moroccan Muslim and uh, he came through for us. So he's helping us fund the uh, document, uh, the documentary research and, the book that we're about to publish. And then we've had some wonderful support research grants from the World Monuments Fund here in the United States. It's a world, uh, worldwide organization. And then even the US Embassy in Cabo Verde has been very helpful to us with a grant here and there helping us fund some uh, archive uh, cleaning and things that we needed to get into the, the archives. So, so the status now is that uh, in the small, the small Jewish burial ground in the larger Catholic cemetery in Praia was rededicated in 2013, but it's a work in progress because we're still working on signage. And I wanted to emphasize the fact that, you know, these are like little monuments, you know, they're not like huge cemeteries where, um, you know, you have to, where you sort of know what you're looking at, but we're treating these as, as the law says, you know, as patrimony and therefore, almost like museum-like uh, artifacts. So I am working, you know, very busily getting these Portuguese and Hebrew tombstones translated. So when people go there and visit, not just the, you know, foreign tra travelers, but locals, I mean, they can read the, the, it's the Portuguese, but they know who these people were, who were, what are their names? You know, a lot of it's in Hebrew. So it took a lot of time, but I have a number of people working within in Israel, in Morocco, or here in the United States of Moroccan descent, who can decipher the uh, the tombstones. So we're working on signage. Santo Antão, we call it the capital of Cabo Verde, excuse me, the Jewish capital of Cabo Verde. Two cemeteries have been restored. We did do the plaques. By the way, another English connection, we had the plaques uh, fabricated in Liverpool. That's because one of our British, um, what do you call it? advisors with the World Monuments Fund, Ben Jeff at the time said, you know, that they do work in bronze and they're very, they do very good work for developing countries because bronze, of course, lasts a long time. And I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. 
Boa Vista, and we do have some uh, straight tunes. So we're, it's a work in progress, but we're, we're really in the thick of it now. So basically this was a before picture in the little Jewish burial ground in the larger um, Catholic cemetery in Praia. And you, we were concerned, look at the, there were some of them were sinking, uh, they could be, sink into oblivion. So that was, that was what was very urgent. And there you have the after uh, picture, which was nicely restored. Um, but again, you know, we have a, 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 a dedication plaque, but what we want to do, and I, I have all the signage ready, but it's one of those, you know, inertia on the, on the side of the Cape Verdean, somebody is, is uh, somehow not, you know, moving forward, but we're going to work on it very assiduously um, this summer to get proper signage so that when people go there, they can read uh, who's buried there and why they went there, similar to what I explained to you, but in a much more succinct description, that these are Jews from the, you know, from the, uh, from the 19th century, they're not, you know, somehow conversos, you know, new Christians, clearly, because that would be a contradiction in terms, they went there as Jews, and they weren't hiding their identity, even if they were, as I said, more modest, because <clears throat> they knew they were in a, Catholic, in a Catholic country. This is a before of the, of the Boa Vista Cemetery, quite a mess, as you can see. Now, this is the, the picture afterwards, but there was some degradation since then. So we're in another uh, phase of working on this. Some, you know, it's right by the sea. There's a lot of erosion and problems with the walls. Anyway, we're working on that now, and that's just the way it is. And on the left, you have David Ben Oliel, I told you, one of the huge uh, benefactors of the island of Boa Vista from the Ben Oliel Benatar family. Uh, and on the right, to show you how these people, these Jews really assimilated and sort of notwithstanding their Jewish faith, they were respectful of their Catholic, um, you know, uh, co not uh, their, their Catholic colleagues. His wife was a staunch Catholic. Donna Bibi is what is how I know her. And, and believe it or not, on the right is he built her a church on the beach and Praia de David. And it's called Capella de David or Capella de Fatima. Uh, unfortunately, that you see a beautiful church there. And then, and then it was dilapidated. Now, this is another story. I don't want to get too uh, far into, you know, into a, a digression, but Don Bibi, that is his wife, once he died, she, she turned over the capella, the church to the Catholic church, and they didn't take very good care of it, and they let it sort of go to pieces. Somebody recently uh, restored it. It, they didn't really follow the original blueprint. We, that is my organization, didn't have really time to deal with this with this particular monument. Uh, but we're sorry that it wasn't that they didn't observe the original blueprint. But nonetheless, um, it has been restored. But that's the story behind it. David Benoliel uh, building a, a church for his Catholic wife. Now they never did have children um, af after all, but. This is the Cohen store, a general store in the island of saint Quentin in Ponte du Sol. I was recently with the, uh, a minister of the government, the Minister of Diaspora Affairs. We were in Rabat for a conference and they have this grand idea that they wanna, they wanna transform this particular building into a sort of a museum or some sort of a you know, historical a site to talk about the, the history of the Jews of, of uh, Cabo Verde. Uh, and so we'll see if they can, if they go, you know, if they're able to raise the funds and do that. And of course, we'd be happy to help them uh, in the curation of that important building in the island where most of the Jews settled. Now, believe it or not, this is a picture of the cemetery in Ponte du Sol. Look at that. There's no urbanization. It's this little, right? You go in and you see the tombstones. And that was in 1998 I was there. And then a few years, about 10 years later, you see more buildings and people are, I'm getting nervous. We need to do something. Uh, and by then I had, of course, just had gotten support from his majesty and to, su to support the restoration of the, of the cemeteries. And that's the inside of it. So you can see again, beautiful tombstones, um, notwithstanding the dilapidated uh, situation. And now this is how it looks afterwards. They got it cleaned up. 
Uh, and they even built this little terrace with a menorah. That was their idea, very, you know, moving that they decided to do that. That was their design, the locals. And you can see it looks over the beautiful ocean. And there we did a little bit of a, we did a beautiful ceremony in 2018 to commemorate the uh, rededication. And these people on the left, we see many locals. This gentleman with the tie, he happens to be the Israeli DCM from Senegal responsible for Cabo Verde. And on his right to our left is the DCM of, of, of the US who came for the ceremony. And we had the, uh, the rabbi of Portugal whom you'll see in a moment. And on the right, this is the plaques that we created in, in Liverpool. This is a, a tomb, the uh, tombstone um, map. So we have a little map and then we explain who's buried and what it says on the tombstone. So we have that part for posterity. And there was a second small cemetery as you can see beforehand. It had already been restored, but it had be, became dilapidated again. And then we, we were hoping to maintain. We're telling these people that it's important for maintenance you know, they like to cut the ribbon and then they don't want to continue. Well, however, we're going to be on it. And so that's afterwards. And uh, this is this, the, we, this is another picture during the second ceremony uh, where this little cemetery was restored and we had a red and the rabbi is doing prayers in honor of the of the deceased. And these were the plaques, as you can see on the wall, the description plaque and the tombstone plaque. And just to show you a few, um, timing wise, oops, um, show you some of the, this is an old picture, of course, of uh, Rafael Ben Oliel. He's an architect from the Ben Oliel family. So David Ben Oliel was one of his uncles. He helped design a restoration plan for the Boa Vista Cemetery. And he's working on this, the second um, finalization of the of the project of the rest. Some more people, uh, Sylvia Benoliel, well, she's actually via marriage. Her husband, uh, Israel, in the middle is a Wanon, and on the right is a, a lady, uh, Hakel Cohen. She's a Pinto, a Cohen, a Benata, a ben Benoliel. She's got a lot of combinations. In her family, there was a lot of attempted intermarriage among the Jewish families. <clears throat> Other connections, uh, this was the gentleman on the left is uh, former Prime Minister Carlos uh, Juan Vega, and uh, the reception the ambassador had for us, the Moroccan ambassador in 2009, kicking off the project on the, in New York, in Washington, DC. The Cohen family on the left, on, on the right, we have Ben Ross. The gentleman on the far right is gonna turn 100 years old this summer. We call him Moses, but his real name is Afonso Ben Ross, and he is full of stories. I tried desperately to speak to him, and I have some wonderful little videos on our website, but I wish I could be there. But he's turning 100 years old. It's, it's really amazing. But he, he speaks a lot about the Jewish families and has a lot of pride. And he was very proud that he never became baptized. In his family, a lot of the children, a lot of his siblings were baptized, but he refused. I don't know if it's because he's just stubborn, but he just didn't want any part of being baptized. Um, but that's, you know, again, that's a digression, but there were some who just, you know, intermarried and uh, some of the spouses maybe wanted, you know, wanted that, but very few really baptized their children the, of the uh, mixed marriages. So this is, this is where we end and ongoing work. We're, you know, it's the, the permanent signage is always is a challenge and I'm determined to get this done no matter how long it takes. We want maintenance plans for each cemetery so that they don't fall back into disrepair, as you know, but in, I guess, everywhere this happens, but particularly in the developing world where they have so many other competing priorities, you know, they like to cut the ribbon and then, okay, we're done. You know, but then it falls back into disrepair. So we're trying to impress upon them the importance of maintenance an importance of you know promoting tourism, cultural and religious tourism, and we hope that that will be an incentive. And more and more people want to visit; they'll have all the more incentive, you know, to keep keep the cemeteries in good shape. Maybe even charge a, a token amount to visit the cemeteries in lieu of you know placing stones on the tomb so that they don't you know further deteriorate them uh, as a way of showing of, of honoring you know the memory of of these people. 
uh, booklets. We're working on that. But again, this is a work in progress. As far as the book on the Jewish presence in the 19th century, the, we have a manuscript currently in a Portuguese with a Portuguese publisher. So it will be published in Portuguese because we funded research into archives, both in Gibraltar, in Cabo Verde, in, in Portugal, and elsewhere. And uh, it's not the end all and be all, but it's a very good start talking about the original so-called settlers, the original immigrants and their impact on the economy. And hopefully more publications will, uh, you know, will spring from that. And we hope to identify other errant tombstones. For example, in um, there's um, in some islands, there's just more tombstones in some of the Catholic cemeteries, but they're just more, you know, we're, we're going to try to identify because some of the of the local governments want us to help them. They they want to honor the memory of the few people who are buried there. And as I said, as far as a permanent museum exhibition, you know, if the if the government is going to buy that house and turn it into a a place of memory to, to honor the Jews and to recount their history, you know, we'll be happy to help them. But it, it's something that we'll, we'll work on. And as I would just say in summary, you know. Who cares, you know, this little tiny island. But on the other hand, um, it's really part and parcel of the identity of the Cape Verdean people. And uh, they want to know. So it's also important for all of us in the diaspora to know that this little, you know, Moroccan diaspora made uh, an indelible impact on this country. And many important people in uh, government and private sector are still there and their descendants and those descendants are proud of their memories. I mean, for example, uh, people, young people write to me to this day. I think I'm of Jewish heritage. One young fellow, I think he may have been even in the Netherlands, Ton, uh, he's a Ben David. And I said to him, well, I think that's a very famous uh, footballer, you know, in Portugal. He said, yeah, he's my great uncle or something like that. Anyway, there's a lot of young people who are interested. It's important for history, for our history, for African history uh, to document a little known and yet somewhat significant chapter. And we want to help the Cabo Verde with tourism. It helps their you know, economic development. They're suffering enormously now with food insecurity as a result of COVID and all these, um, as you know, uh, the impacts from the war in Ukraine and grains and so forth. And so now more than ever, they need to, they're depending on tourism. And so we're hoping that this might be an aspect of tourism that they can market, you know, the not just for the Jews, but others. But, you know, hopefully we can make a difference in helping them uh, accentuate and provide the educational materials um, to describe the impact of the Moroccan Jews. And, um, and that's where we are. And then there's our website, if anybody's interested. And uh, I hope I didn't drone on too long. And, but that's pretty much the story. Thank you. Thank, thank you uh, very much for your talk. And also thank you for your work, because it's a real act of uh, Kiddush Hashem. It's really important to, uh, to preserve our, our, our monuments and our, our graves. Um, you, you, you mentioned um, sort of, uh, your booklet and um, archives. Could you just give us an idea of, of what records uh, exist of this community? I mean, uh, perhaps in Cabo Verde or in Portugal? Sure. Um, or indeed Gibraltar. Very good. Uh, you know, I'm not the historian, but we did hire a, a young woman who actually is of uh, Jewish descent. She's Cape Verdean. She lives in Portugal. And she went into the archives in Cabo Verde. You know, the um, records of, of um, births and, and travel documents, uh, deaths, uh, it's it's just, and trying to get a sense of, you know, some of their um, court, they had a lot of, there was a lot of court proceedings as well. And that gave us a, a good idea of what they were up to. And of course, in, in Portugal, she went into primarily the Ultramarino, Arquivo de Ultramarino, uh, the, of the overseas territories, not so much the Torre de Tombo, which would be more from Inquisition days, and there were other documents there that gave us some insights. But, you know, in Morocco, we, I thought, you know, we could get some more information from them, but I keep learning each year goes by. We, we, you and I and Ton were talking about this earlier. 
There are some people um, in Morocco who now live in Israel uh, or who one particular Tanger, uh, Tangerian rabbi, some of them like have private archives and we're going to chase them down. Maybe there's Ketubah. I mean, because again, in once they were in Cabo Verde, they wouldn't, there was very little religious stuff that we know, but there was these civil records. And so they will be, you know, they're referenced in the, in the forthcoming book, which will, as I said, be in Portuguese, because of course that's the language of the country, but we hope to translate it, you know, quickly thereafter into English and of course French, if the Moroccans are interested in helping us in that regard. So those are, th those are, and then of course we have a lot of memories and oral interviews that, you know, that we're documenting. I may do something later, another book or some mon mono, uh, some kind of a um, monograph, you know, but I, I think that there's, there has to be more but this is the type of, these are the type of records. Thank in you. Gibraltar, for example, you know, we went, we met with the archivist. I mean, what we did, what we found was a common ancestor for Wanon, you know, like the, the Wanon family, um, there's no, they just went into different directions. Some came to New York, others, you know, went to the you know, Cabo Verde, but they all have the same route, which is fascinating you know, that we were able to, to, to confirm. Uh, thank you. And I, actually, we, we, we know Joshua uh, Marachi, and he's, he's, uh, he's spoken to our group as well. Um, can you give us an idea of, of uh, for those who migrated, where they, where they went to after Cabo Verde? The, right. Mostly Portugal. In other words, they don't forget. And one thing I didn't mention is that this was their reference point always. So notwithstanding, they came from Morocco. Some went back to Morocco, we know. And again, this is to be developed. Uh, you know, we decided we're not gonna wait to publish our book uh, until we get all the information. We're just gonna publish the historical data we have and we're encouraging others to build upon it. You know, we don't own this topic. Of course, we wanna receive the credit for, for the work we've done, but uh, we hope to spur all kinds of other research. I, I'm, for one, I'm interested in relationships between the Cape Verdean families and those in Northern Brazil. And there's similar names, clearly, and there are connections. Somebody may want to look into that. But um, a lot of them went back to Portugal. A lot of them, some of them, you know, would, would go to Portugal to the synagogue there. And so that's another source that we looked into. And there's some, I think, documentation in the forthcoming book from from the uh, community, uh, the Israelite Comunidade Israelite de Lisboa, some of the archives there, because some of them gave money. You know, they, they made contributions. Um, we have records of that that we talk about in the book. And, you know, one of the families, the Pinto family, there are ties here in this country. So some, you know, have relatives in this in this country. You say they're, you know, they are of Jewish descent. The Ben Ross family. So various generations, you know, emigrated to various places, and also Venezuela, and um, possibly Argentina. You you have remnants of these families, but Portugal would be the reference main, main reference point. How Thank big you. was the community uh, uh, in the high part? How, how big it was? Yes, I mean, probably okay. 120, maybe something like that. And mm. and don't forget the maybe it, around the hundred mark. And and then there's just the, the 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 huge families they would have, you know. So then they somebody said one of the one on families said they think that the Jews populated most of the island of Santuintão. Now that's probably a bit of hyperbole, but um, that particular island is um okay let's see where it is oh no wait i'd have to go all the way back um let's see here I, I should have blown up the islands but anyway uh you know santuinto anyway there you see the it's let's see it's in the north the very very top if you can see in that blown up uh anyway that that's where they a lot of them settled in these two islands up here and so, so that's what happened. It was a lot of uh, intermarrying and lots of kids and lots of children, some within marriage, some outside. 
and that's another topic, of course, I didn't want to get into, but um, some of them, you know, they, as I said, they, they, there was marriage, but it was, you know, not in the Catholic church, except for one, one or two exceptions. Mm -hmm. Some were just, uh, you know, they lived together, but they were considered the descendants of the, of the Jewish, uh, the Jewish uh, spouse, you know, received like mostly men, they, they passed on the name and, and, and all the, uh, what do you call that? The inheritance went to the children. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of, uh, of our viewers asked about Angola. Is yes. there any evidence of migration to Angola? Absolutely. No question about it. You know, one of these days we'll get around to Angola, but they were more like a diaspora of the, of the Cape Verdean Jews. So in other words, these Jews, it seems that it was like the, the hub, Cabo Verde. Uh, mm -hmm. in, the, um, in the Portuguese colonial empire. And for certain, the Benuliel, Cohen, they did do business. And there are tombstones in, in Angola, mm -hmm. no question about it. I don't think there are separate cemeteries, but they're like, they're extensions of the families that, that settled in Cabo Verde. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, one day, I, the last time I was in Angola was over 20 years ago. Yeah. And part of it is my job keeps me from, exploring but i hope to go there another time and and see what we you know see what we can do to at least find any remnants there but there's also san tome tiny little island which is not seen on this map you know way at the gulf of guinea mm -hmm. it's really literally on the equator san tome it's san tome principi i think you've heard of some of maybe those of you who like to go on cruises i think there's a cruise ship that goes there they go to cape verde too i think they're starting up again um and that's why we want to help them, you know, with these cemeteries. We want to we want to encourage people to visit them as they visit the beaches and the other sites, which are interesting. And say, at one time there were these Moroccan Jews who who lived here and and made contributions. But in Saint Tome, there's two little tombstones, Mr. Gabay and Mr. Cohen, who are at the edge of the of the Catholic cemetery that I found, you know, back in the '90s. And I keep I check on them from one from time to time with one of my friends making sure they're taken care of. So Azenko, a big family in San, in, um, San, in San Tome, yeah. Azenko, which also is in Cabo Verde. Well, one of our viewers says that your fundraising story with the king is unique. And he thinks that you thought you should approach the Pope <laughs> to get him involved. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, someone also asked if you ever came across the Zahar family. Uh, the which family? Zahar. Uh, spell, can you spell that? Uh, Z A H A R. Zahar. Zahar. No, I have not. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't mean, you know. It was a long shot. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, if it's Moroccan, but. Unfortunately, I, I have I see not. that Bernard Miller has his hand up. Can you unmute him, David? I'm unmuted. Hi, Carol. Can I A, thank you, and B, congratulate you? It's a fantastic thing that you have done and are doing. Um, and I have a couple of very specific questions. I lived in Angola for most of 1992 and really? Guinea-Bissau for most of 1993. And it would never have occurred to me to look for Jewish connections, partly because I was working 18 hours a day. But uh -huh. um, uh, I, you've already mentioned the um, Angola connection, the um, Cabo Verde um, diaspora going to Angola. I've actually tracked three ancestors who were governors of Angola, but they must have gone out as new Christians. It's three generations of the same family. So late 18th, early 19th and mid 19th century. Um, but I'm intrigued to know <clears throat> Um, what the influence was that they left behind. Have you come across at all anything about Guinea-Bissau, um, which is the saddest, poorest country I've ever lived in? 
Um, and I just wanted to say in connection with the King of Morocco story, um, on Thursday evening, I saw a film called um, Tuboca Los Cielos, which is made about and by the Moroccan Hakatiya speaking population. And it's in the form of a letter of love and thanks to the Catholic kings who expelled their ancestors for the five or six centuries of culture that they've given. But in it, they talk about the role of a king of Morocco basically sponsoring the Jewish community. And it's quite well explained. I mean, I think that must have been two kings earlier, but I think it's an important story. I recommend the film. Oh, um, I'd love it, to see you know, it. it goes under the name in English. Um, I think it's um, Your Wishes to the Sky, um, which I think is a mistranslation because um, De Tuboc a los Cielos is basically a version of From Your Lips to God's Ears, um, which is that if you pray for it, God will hear it. But anyway, um, I, I just throw that in because I think people will be interested. I'll post that in the chat. But if you do yes, know how do I, yeah, about I, it yourself. I'd love to see that. How, how does one view this film? Um, it has been on YouTube, uh, sorry, on Vimeo, free for a week, paid for by the Sephardic Synagogue of Los Angeles. Huh. Um, after tonight, it will cease to be free, but I'll post the link so that people um, can watch it tonight yeah. if they want yeah. to. Um, okay, I would love to. And after that, I think you have to pay for it on Vimeo. But somebody said they think it's already been pirated onto YouTube. Is that right? Anyway, I'll post the link while you're talking. Okay, that's wonderful. And you're you are Bernard Miller. I'm Bernard Miller. And tell me, are you so? You what? What were you doing in Angola and Guinea? I was working for the UN, supposedly oh. organizing first free, fair, and democratic elections. Ah! Um, yeah, well, yeah. they were first. I think that's all I can say about them. In the case of Angola, I put in a report a month before saying, if you go ahead, there will be civil war. And there was, and it lasted a decade. In the case of Guinea-Bissau, I put in a joint statement with the US and the French ambassadors saying, unless you put funding into these elections, this is what will happen. The president in office will be re-elected with a majority of 60-40. There will then be a return from exile of the leader of the opposition in exile and a civil war, and it all came to pass. So, um, so that's what I was doing, and um, it's kind of difficult for me to get back there. And you were working for the for the UK government. And I was working for the UN. You were the, so the UNDP, UNDP. Um, who, who were responsible for yeah. electoral assistance. Right. No, exactly. Well, as far as Guinea-Bissau, all I can say is, you know, if there are there may be similar same families from Cabo Verde, but you know, I sort of recognize. Mm -hmm. Some of the together. names, but I wasn't looking at that time. I wasn't really yeah. looking for Sephardic heritage. I mean, this is right. um, getting on for 30 years ago. Um, so, yeah, as you know, Guinea-Bissau had a different status. Uh, you know, C C Ver Cabo Verde was much more, um, you know, it was the more Aggressive. favored yeah, they fa they the Portuguese favored and the Cape Verdeans would often be administrative officials in some of these places. Anyway, yeah. Ibiza was yeah it was like a penal colony. Yeah, for, for many years. Um, but anyway, if there are Jewish, you know, there's certainly probably the similar some of the families. But it's, I don't know about the tombstones there. I haven't been there too. The last time I was there was in nineteen. Let's see, nine one of the years. Uh, 90, maybe it was around that 92. Uh, the election they had, in Ibiza was yeah. 94. Oh, was it? Okay. Well, and whenever I went the of the democracy, I must have sparked a revolution because there was chaos after I left. 
<laughs> we did a good governance. I did a good governance <laughs> conference with the U, with U, USAID. I remember, and as mm. soon as I got back, things went, you know, thank, <laughs> things thank blew you. up. Can, so, so sorry. Can we um, just go across yeah. to to YouTube now, just to um, see what uh, questions we have? Oh, of course, um, Dennis uh, mentions uh, you, you. You can't talk about Cabo Verde without uh, mentioning the uh, singer Cesaria Ever. Oh, yeah. who, uh, if if you don't know uh, Portuguese uh, language music, she she is one of the uh, all time uh, greats. Um, there is a comment here that historical archives in Jamaica have huge records on merchant ships from uh, Cabo Verde to Jamaica, Brazil, West Indies, and the um, South America, um, which I didn't know, which is uh, useful. There's just a general question about uh, perhaps. No, perhaps Tom Tom can help with this. On uh, do do we know how many Jewish people were in Portugal before the uh, Inquisition? I, I suppose that's after uh, everyone came from Spain. I, I don't know. Yeah. What, what do you reckon? Uh, some thirty thousand. Yeah. Okay. So that sounds about right. That's, and sorry. I would have thought more. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, well. Uh, there's a book from 1987 from Maria Tavares. She counted uh, tax lists and she okay. came to a number of 30,000. Thank this you. This was before the Inquisition? Uh, uh, this was before the, uh, the Portuguese Inquisition and right. after the Portuguese, after the uh, Jews left Spain to Portugal. Yeah. And that was a number of 30,000 also. Okay. And also, uh, Torin Tor mentions um, the uh, book by uh, Mark and Horta, The Forgotten Diaspora, on, uh, if, if, if I'm right, it's on, on the community and sort of the, the Senegambia um, area, um, which is, is fascinating. We actually should get one of them to uh, come and speak with us. I don't know this book. I'd love to read it. Um, it's called The Forgotten Diaspora. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think one of them is British and the other is is Portuguese and uh, it, it, it's it's another fascinating little uh, episode in Sephardic history um, Tom do we have any any further questions or shall we um, uh, no, a lot on? of uh, thank yous and yes. uh, people saying uh, fascinating uh, presentation etc and mm -hmm. uh, I think we can wrap up. Okay, let me just and share. just putting in the the film link and the password. I've put in the film link. I'm just going to put in the password. I'll okay. share. I'll share the film link. I'm afraid I'm not going to share the password. No, I well, then people won't be able to see it. Oh, actually, they will. They will. Oh. They will see it. It's it's in there. It's just the, the explanation about using it is in Spanish. If you look below Vimeo, it tells you the password to enter. Right. In Spanish. The film is subtitled in English all the way through. How long Thank is you. it? Would you say fifty-seven minutes? Oh well, when, I will definitely watch it. Now I don't see anything that you're putting in. I hope, Mister Bernard, or I hope you will. Uh, send me an, an email or I yeah. don't know what, do you have my if you want I wouldn't give people my email if you're interested we we, um, we can forward we can forward that to you yeah okay. forward, forward that and because I would like to keep in touch with you and some others if there's sure. anything you need I want anybody else feel free I mean there's a general email uh, info at Kabul uh, Kate Verity Jewish Heritage dot org and um, I'll sign up for it or do you go into the website I really um, speaking of like singers, for example, so Cesaria Evora, but and I didn't, I couldn't put all of this in the in in the PowerPoint. But there is a famous singer of Jewish descent. Her name is Gardenia, Gardenia Benros. So she's from the Benros family from Tangier, and she's a beautiful young lady. I mean, now she's younger than Cesaria, who has passed away. I think she's probably in her late fifties now, but. I mean, she is quite the diva, a beautiful voice, and she was a big hit. She was on our trip in 2015, and she sang all the way in, in Morocco. She would sing a cappella, 
in 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 uh, Creole, and she learned even Ladino a song. She sang. So on our video, on our what do you call it, YouTube channel, you can see her. I mean, you might enjoy it. You know, so just explore if you will, if you would like some of the tabs, um, and, and some of the little. We had her in a in a in the Medina in Rabat. We had the drummers, and she started singing in Creole, and they would play the drums with the Moroccan rhythm and like there was this fusion. It was really nice. Uh, so they, they're really in, the, all the descendants made, made, have made marks in all the various, um, you know, fields of work to this day. So that's, that's something interesting. So. Ton, Ton, would you like to uh, close the meeting? Well, thank you, Carol, for your lively talk and very interesting uh, facts concerning a, a very sm a small Sephardic outpost in the world, but it's uh, part of the Sephardic world anyway. And um, well, one day we hope to see you again speaking for us. Well, we liked it very much. Well, thank you. It was such a pleasure. I'm very honored that you invited me, and I greatly look forward to more cooperation with you and all of your members and participants. Mm -hmm. Feel free to contact me anytime, and I hope to come to London again <laughs> soon. <laughs> You're very welcome. Okay. And don't forget, I didn't say I'm half British, by the way, for Mr. Miller. My mother's from England, so... I may not have Sephardic blood, but I'm, I'm half British, so I'm very proud of that as well. <laughs> and this brings me to our patrons. We thank them very much for making all of this possible. Without them, uh, you would not have been here. Uh, and thank you to our viewers on, uh, Zoom, uh, on YouTube. And we hope to see you all next week. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody.